Welcome back, Came to Catholic, um, <clears throat> or Honors Western Civ, as I should say. We're going to go ahead and take this Saturday to finish up our little teeny tiny bit we have left about the Byzantine. And now, some of you are probably thinking, well, this empire lasted for another, let's see, almost a thousand years after the fall of Rome during the Middle Ages, which is kind of really biased when you think the fact that it was called the Dark Ages, but there was still a Western Civ that was very powerful. <clears throat> but we're going to get into more detail with them when we actually get to the quote-unquote dark ages in Europe. So we kind of just got to set the stage for them, and then we're going to talk about the early Middle Ages in Europe and how they relate to one another with the Byzantine. And you would really think that if the Byzantine was doing fine that they would be able to spread their influence to the other parts of Europe, but we'll get to that later. So we had just finished up talking about Justinian and the power of him and his ruling bride, Theodora, right? And apparently she was an actress before they, when they finally met each other. But, um, so a lot of cool things about them. Uh, uh, Justinian created civil law and Justinian's code. And this was like the third, fourth type actually of law that we've talked about to originate in, uh, in world history. So, <clears throat> Also, there was a very strong military under Justinian, an army equipped with Greek fire. It was like the very first type of napalm. We still don't know exactly what it was made out of, but we believe it had to be, must have been some type of mixture of pitch and some type of oil. Because when you try to put a grease fire out with water, what happens? It just gets worse, right? So, modern day scientists believe it may have had something to do with that. So, right here, as you can see. Um, these are some very, two very key pictures, or three actually. So jot down a couple of things. Now, number one, Greek fire made them very, very formidable as an opponent. Because remember, how, uh, what was Constantinople's number one strategical advantage? They were surrounded on three sides by water, right? And then to compensate for that on the other side, they built these large walls, as you can see right here in the top right picture, okay? So, however, this is not going to protect them for forever. And we'll get to that in a second. But please take two seconds to see the amazing piece of cultural diffusion that exists in the bottom right-hand corner of the screen. That right there is one of Mr. Terry's top ten places I have to see before I die. And that's the Aga Sophia. All right. So the Aga Sophia was actually constructed in the Byzantine Empire. It's one of the very first major, major Christian monuments under... <clears throat> former Roman rule. It's enormous, right? It exists in uh, Istanbul today. And now, how can you tell, though, because, of course, Istanbul is now in Turkey, which is a, I guess, I wouldn't call it Middle Eastern, actually. I'd call it more like Eastern Europe. Uh, but they're a very heavily Islamic country, right? How can you see the union of European architecture and Middle Eastern architecture? I'm going to give you about two seconds to think about that. All right, I can hear some of you kind of in your mind. I can hear it, right? There's a difference right here. These four towers on the outside, they're called minarets, all right? And minarets is what Muslim, uh, excuse me, people of the Islamic faith use for their call to prayer. Anybody know how many times, uh, <clears throat> anybody know how many times Muslims pray a day? Good job, Linkowski. Five, right? They pray five times a day. So, Typically, or not even typically, what happens is um, a prayer caller will go up into the top of this minaret and sing the call to prayer, right? For everyone to stop doing what they're doing and to pray. And so now these are more decorative minarets because usually minarets exist by one alone, like it's just one structure. But they became a very big reoccurring theme in Islamic architecture. And so, and as you can see right here, the Aga Sophia has Roman and Greek architectural um, influences with the domes and the arcs, or the arches that exist on them. So, now unfortunately, even though there's this amazing, amazing landmark and all of this great architecture and all of that great mosaic Byzantine tiled work art that we were looking at, they're going to suffer from one similar thing <coughs> that the uh, Romans suffered from, and that's frequent what? Exactly, Ray. Invasions, right? So as you can see down here on the left, the Byzantine was frequently invaded, and that has to do with one key aspect, because during the Dark Ages, quote-unquote Dark Ages, right, during the Middle Ages in Europe, 
Eurocentristic people and people that believe that the only importance is Europe, that's why they put them right smack in the middle of the map, they believe that the entire world was in the Dark Ages. Now, this is ignorant, okay? Because the Umayyad Caliphate and the Muslim empires were actually expanding at a massive rate during the 600s, all right? So that is a very intimidating thing because if you looked close enough at the map, the Byzantine Empire encompasses what holy city and what holy land? Jerusalem, right? So all of, like, when the Muslims realize that their power is that of the Byzantines, they're going to attack because they're trying to gain their holy land. And then this is going to lead to what set of wars? Boom! The Crusades, right? So we'll talk about all that later on because I remember Ray made a comment in class. It's like, it's really kind of convenient how one empire ends and another one starts. This is where that stops. There's going to be a lot of weird little overlap now, okay? But you have to talk about them independently to be able to fully appreciate all of them. So anyway, let's continue that. The Byzantine is going to start to shrink after Justinian. They were attacked by all kinds of different quote-unquote, I wouldn't even call them barbarians because they were actually doing really well for themselves. Mo most of these people were new um, Islamic faith caliphates, right? And the, the, the biggest and the baddest was the Umayyads and the Abbasids, but we'll talk, we'll talk about them later. So anyway, now, the Slavs, Persians, Vikings, Huns, and Turks all came after the Byzantines. Now, the Vikings, the Huns, and the Slavs didn't really care too much about that land, or they didn't really care too much about the holy aspect of it, right? However, the Turks and the Persians did, all right? So the Turks and the Persians are a part of the new Muslim faith. Because remember, Islam is the youngest monotheism to exist. It's only been around for 600 years. So, or not 600, wait, no. It only started in like 600 AD, right? 600 years after the establishment of Christianity, the uh, Islam came, or like Islam, the nation of Islam like started. So, their holy lands are still in Jerusalem, just like the Jews and the Christians as well. And this is going to start that major power struggle for it. Okay, so the Byzantine church, though, is going to also kind of in, inadvertently weaken itself. So a king was a patriarch under the Byzantine church. Now we'll keep going with this when we get to uh, the Catholic church following the Middle Ages. And this led to a lot of that Protestant Reformation stuff because kings wanted to be patriarchs, but the Pope wouldn't let them. So now, but a patriarch is a church leader. So Justinian was a church leader. Constantine was a church leader, right? Now, really quick, let's discuss this photograph. Now, a lot of the CP kids don't really get this reference, but as you look right here, does this man look like a church leader? Look at the cross, the garments, the vestments. Of course he is, right? However, what are some of the differences between what he wears and let's say what Francis wears? There you go, right? This happened during the Byzantine church. All of a sudden, there was a great schism, all right? It's one of my favorite words in all of English writers, schism. Just say it one time, just say it. Schism. I hear you over there, Laura. Schism. There you go. Now, the church in the Byzantine split in half, and it all had to do with idol worship. Like, <clears throat> now remember, all of these people were Catholic, well, Roman Catholic by faith, right? Into Catholicism. Saints are very, very important. Saints are extremely important. Did you know there's over 10,000 current day Catholic saints? They're just slinging out, what's it called? Canonization left and right, right? So the church split though, due to the idea that there were some very hardcore Eastern Orthodox worshipers in the Eastern half of the Byzantine saying, you shouldn't have statues of anyone but Christ in your churches. And then on the Western half, they were saying, but saints are so important to us. So there was this massive schism after Justinian, Justinian right? due to the differences in worship across the empire. Great schism. And this weakened their, their empire, though, because now you have conflicting faiths, faith practices, among your own people, so you can't really mobilize everybody, right? So, last thing. What's going to happen to the poor Byzantine later on in 1090 AD? The Crusades are going to leave them very weak. Constantinople is going to be conquered by the Turks, and many famous Christian sites are actually still there. Because remember, Persian culture says... We don't care if you keep your cultural identity. We just want our what? Our taxes, right? So, something that's always really important to remember when we look at things. Early Romans destroyed Christian sites and Jewish sites as well. And we kind of think of ourselves as the high and mightier, whereas the Islamic faith people have actually been saving artifacts of different religions for hundreds of years, right? So, and then unfortunately after the Byzantine falls, though, to the Turks, it becomes the nation of Turkey, right? So, <clears throat> well, actually, it was a part of the Umayyad and the Abbasid Empire for a long, long time. But today, the bulk of the Byzantine Empire is current-day Turkey. So, 
that's it. And I hope you all have a fantastic weekend. You're welcome, Simon. I posted this on a Saturday, not when football's on. So, y'all have a great afternoon. I'll see y'all on Monday.